So, hi guys, I'm Arjoy Lanuza, one of your campus missionaries. And I've been with WordCom since I was four years old. So now I'm 25, it's been 20 to 21 years since I've been with WordCom and I can really say this is my second home already. And I'm also part of a life group that is led by Ate Karen. Is Ate Karen here? I think she's there! There she is! Hi, Ate Karen! And I'm really thankful for my life group. Uh, my life group has been an instrumental part of my walk with the Lord. These people have been with me in a few of my milestones in my life. And even especially during my lowest times, they were there. And I'm thankful for a loving community where I get to grow in the knowledge of Christ and journey with my fellow Christians. And so if you are not yet a part of a life group, I highly encourage you guys to um, be in one. Really, it's, it's, a, it's a community where you get to be filled with the word, but as well journeying with them. And uh, you can approach our elders or our admin team to get you uh, plugged in a life group. And so for today, may I ask everyone to please stand as we read uh, the scripture for today. You can turn your Bibles to page 591 and I'll be reading from Second P uh, Second Peter chapter 3 verses 11 to 13. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. God bless the reading of his holy word. Uh, let's pray for our speaker for today. Lord, I praise you and thank you for your word, Lord, that we can trust and rely on your word, Lord God. I pray and lift up to you our elder, Elder Paul, who would be delivering your word today. O oh Lord, may you use him mightily. Father, I pray that may his confidence be rooted in the finished work of Jesus Christ, speaking from the truth that you have given to him, Lord God. And Lord, I pray that the people who would be hearing your word, may you soften their hearts, Lord. Grant them listening ears, Father. Open their eyes to the truth. And I pray that our hearts and our minds would be focused on you and you alone. May you be glorified today in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, our joy. Oh, you may have seats now. You may take your seats. Unless you want to stand. That's fine. Uh, 50 minutes, 50 minutes, or no, no, I'm, he, he's way above there. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Okay. I shall return. I shall return. These are famous words spoken by a man named General Douglas MacArthur. And for many of you who are familiar with this line, this is something that we've learned in high school. I guess I know for my generation and for those that preceded mine, this was something that was taught in school. I'm not sure if they teach yeah, this. Still, still. They still do. Good. So you know the context, right? The uh, Philippines was uh, invaded by the Japanese during the World War II. And the Americans came over. He came. He was sent here to fight alongside the Filipinos. He came to fight and to free us. But somehow... They were overwhelmed, and he had to leave. He left in defeat. He also had to leave because of fear of his life. And, well, his retreat didn't exactly sit very well. It brought a lot of despair, and not only despair, but it took away hope. Now, he came back. As we know from history, he was able to regroup. MacArthur did return. He came to liberate the Philippines. 
And when you think about it, we, we aren't exactly free. We aren't completely free because we were just freed from one oppressor only to be oppressed by another. And even when you think about it now, we are still living in a very sinful world. Nothing much has changed for us, right? There's still suffering when you think about it. There's affliction, there's pain, there's poverty. We have injustice, there's corruption, and there's death. The curse of Adam still remains. Now contrast this with another, with another man who says that he will return. The angel said to the apostles, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus himself said and told his disciples, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now the difference here is that when Jesus left, he didn't leave because he lost. Jesus left because he had already accomplished the work that the Father had given him. He was sent here and he finished the work that was given to him. He came to save, just as MacArthur was sent to save. But here, Jesus came to save, and he triumphed over death. He triumphed over sin. And when he left, he left victorious. Whereas one fled to avoid death, Jesus came, he stayed, he remained, he faced death, he died. Yes. And after three days, he rose again, again, that which we celebrated last Sunday. And he ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father, in reference to emphasize his lordship. And often and with good measure, this is something we focus on a lot. Up to this point, we focus on, on Christ's birth. We talk about his life, his ministry, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, and even at times we talk about his ascension. These are some things that we preach about or we speak, especially when we share the gospel. But his second coming is not exactly something we focus on or talk about too much. We often think of what happens after. That is what we think most often of, what happens after. We do think of the eternal state, that glorious, eternal, glorious day of God. We think of, the, of heaven, of being in God's presence for all eternity. We think of the good stuff. We think of heaven, of righteousness, but we do not think about what happens before it, what precedes it. Not so much of what precedes all this. Now we have to remember when Jesus came, he came as a savior. He came as a savior. But you see, we also know when he says that he will return, he returns as a judge. He returns as a judge. You see, he doesn't come back to save more people. That's not what he is coming back for. His work is finished. Remember, it is finished. He said so. He will come as a judge. He returns not to liberate sinners, but to judge. And what he brings with him, he brings judgment. He brings the condemnation, condemnation of God's wrath for those who have rejected Christ. And in doing so, what follows is that he ushers in a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more sin, no more affliction, no more pain, no suffering, no no tear that will be shed, especially for those whom he has saved, those who belong to him. It is a time when righteousness will dwell forever. The question to ask is, When is all this going to happen? Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware 
that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We find that there are still so many believers who are preoccupied and who fancy in predicting the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are sensationalists or even end times enthusiasts who spend a great deal of time and effort to predict the timing of Jesus' return, some even pointing to the exact date. But of course, they do so in vain. Again, as Jesus stated, no man knows the day or the hour of his return, only the Father. Unfortunately, these people who engage in such foolishness and make public declarations of their predictions not only embarrass themselves, but they also embarrass the name of Christ and of his church. Now, we can have much concern for these things. We can be concerned for a church to fall into such over-the-top expectancy about Christ's return, but the greatest danger, the real danger is for a church to act as though Christ is not returning at all. Yeah. You know, two decades ago, about 20 or so years ago, uh, there was much preaching, sermons, there's a lot of material written about Jesus' second coming. But you see, such interest seems to have faded. It lost its relevancy and made way for teachings on how to live your best life now as though this was the only life to look forward to. But you see, this ought not to be the case for us. This shouldn't be defining us. As genuine Christians, we are a second coming people. Now, we may hold differing positions on both the millennium, whether you're a pre, post, or a millennialist, millennialist and the tribulation. I personally hold a pre tribulation position because I want to be raptured before the tribulation. But despite these differences, I believe genuine Christians, as we all are, are in agreement. We are in agreement, no argument, that Jesus will return. Amen. He will literally return, yeah. which can happen anytime soon. And so the most important question to ask is not about will Jesus return. That is settled. There's no argument there. It's clear, and the question is not when will he return. Again, that is unknowable. It is beyond us. And so then what should we be asking ourselves? Let us turn to the text in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, to set us up for this. Now, I thought to use Paul. We use Paul a lot in our preaching and in our teaching, so I decided to give Peter some time as well. So this is something that Peter wrote for us. It's a very powerful letter. It has a profound message for all of us in light of Christ's return. And it says in the first verse, or the, in verse 11, it says, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Now, we need to understand that Jesus' second coming is not some abstract doctrine that has no bearing on our life as Christians. The Bible is replete with references of Jesus' second coming. Even Paul frequently has references to it, even elaborates the circumstances of his return, of Christ's return. And from Scripture, from Scripture, we can understand and come to the conclusion that history has an end. History has a goal. There is a purpose for history. You see, if Jesus is not coming, if there is no judgment, if God does not intervene, then you see men are left with absolutely no hope. There is no future glory to look forward to. There is nothing. If Jesus is not coming back, we have nothing. Much like the resurrection, when we speak of the resurrection, of how 
important and how essential the resurrection is, our Christian faith either falls or stands on the resurrection of Christ. And it has the same here for Christ's second coming, that our faith becomes futile or vain. We look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see, we are to be most pitied because all the sacrifices that we make in this life, in light of the hope of his return, of the hope that is to come, and if there is no life to come, that is the eternal life, it would be better for us to just eat, drink, and be merry, and do whatever we want to do, seeking whatever pleasure our hearts desire. And there you have hedonism right there. You see, when men reject the view of history having a climax, when they reject that God will intervene through the return of His Son, Jesus Christ, and bring history to its proper end, when there is that belief that there is no end, then this just leads us to live a life any way we want to live. Nothing's going to hold us back. Everything, everything just ends in despair. You think about it. Without God intervening and having an end for history, life has absolutely no meaning at all. There's no point. So Peter, together with Paul, as Paul and Peter writes, they too are concerned that we as believers must have a proper understanding and a proper posture, a proper response to the return of Jesus Christ. These apostles give emphasis not only on his return, but to the church posture as a bride in waiting. <laughs> What Jesus will do and when, these are important circumstances to consider. They are important, but they are not the most critical ones. The more crucial consideration for us is how we should live in light of his impending return. Now, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness? And godliness. Take note, that's not a question. When Peter wrote this, he did not end that verse with a question mark. It ended with an exclamation. You see, it is to be treated in the same way as when we sing and praise, How great is thy God! How great is thy God! It's not a question to be answered. But it's an exclamation. We are exclaiming something amazing, something beyond us, something astonishing. And if we were to put the verse another way, we could read it this way. Since all things are thus to be dissolved, you are to live. You ought to live lives of holiness and godliness. Especially when you know you are going to see beyond the day of the Lord, the day of God the eternal glory. And this is a straightforward challenge to every Christian. It is a challenge to us to conform our lives to this reality, to the reality of eternity. Think about it. If Jesus is coming to reward you, if Jesus is coming to take you back to himself, if Jesus is coming to usher us into a new heaven and a new earth, if Jesus is coming to deliver you from judgment and to bring you into the great, eternal, and glorious day of God, if Jesus is coming to take you away from judgment, to take you into the kingdom, to take you into a kingdom of light, a kingdom of righteousness, that ought to impact your life. Don't you think so? So we have been created for that. Remember, we have been saved for that reason. We have been redeemed. We are being sanctified for that. 
And because of this, we ought to live our lives in light of that reality. Because for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And if that is what we have been saved for, remember, again, it is God who saved us. We didn't save ourselves. If that is what we have been saved for, then we ought to live now, even now, consistent with our destiny. So now that we know whether it is not whether Jesus returns or when he returns, it's about what kind of people ought we to be then? How are we to live in light of Jesus' return? We know that we are not living for this world. We are not of this world. We are just foreigners. We are actually strangers. We're just passing through this world. We are not part of this world system. We shouldn't be. We are not to love this world or the things of this world. This is not our place. We belong to a heavenly place. We belong and we look for a city whose builder is God. A city not built by the hands of men, but an eternal place, a heavenly place. Now, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Does this answer our question in terms of how we live our lives in the workplace or at home or in school, even in church? Not so. It's in everything we do, in lives of holiness and godliness. This is the area in which we are to live. In everything you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy, Peter writes. And he cites that from Leviticus. I read somewhere that holiness refers to action and that godliness refers to attitude. That holiness points to the way I live my life. And godliness refers to that spirit of reverence by which I live my life. Holiness is behavior. It's external. That is something that people can see. And godliness is heart. It is something that, which only God can see. And so we are called to live lives of both holiness and godliness. We cannot live a holy life and be ungodly, nor can we live an, an, an unholy life and yet be godly. It just cannot connect. There's no way. So are we living our lives in light of Christ's return with the right heart and behavior? Are we living with the right attitude and action? Now, there are several things that characterize how we should live in light of this, in light of Christ's return. These implications should mark us out in holy conduct and godliness. There are several, but we shall just focus on three this morning. Unless I have your permission to give, you, to give me more time, I can spend half a day on this one. <laughs> but we will just focus on three this morning. To live your life with an expectant hope. We go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, which is holiness, and being sober-minded, that is godliness, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, to set your hope fully in light of our great salvation, Christians, especially those who are Suffering, those who are experiencing hardship and persecution, Christians should live without any reservation, without any reservations and sincerely for the future. Shouldn't hesitate. 
rather anticipate. Anticipate the consummation of our salvation, of your salvation as Christians at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is to live in light of that immeasurable, unfathomable grace that is going to be bestowed upon you and me when Jesus is fully revealed in all his glory and when he sets up his eternal kingdom. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 says, Paul describes Jesus' second coming as the church's blessed hope. It says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, for, for most Christians throughout the first, throughout the early history or the first century church, expecting the second coming was more than just the hope from moving from a good life to an eternal, glorious life. It included a yearning, a yearning from death and destruction, a yearning from war and disease. It included a yearning from poverty and persecution and even, to a certain extent, martyrdom. And I recall one pastor who said fondly that what he looks forward to is not just an eternal life of glory, but a life where there is just no sin. Sin does not exist, just righteousness. And today we find most believers, today we find most believers, in, especially in democratic societies such as ours, enjoying life in relative comfort. We have much religious freedom. We have access to advances in medicine, technology within reach. We are able to pursue trendy lifestyles. We have other modern conveniences. Now, while all these have brought earthly comfort to us, they also bring about spiritual complacency. Whereas in some countries, religious freedom is denied or limited, they face persecution and hate and harm. I know of a story where we have missionaries who've gone to certain countries, especially in the communist countries, where they would gather some people and each one would have to tear off a page of the Bible, read it, memorize it, one person, one page, so that it could be copied and shared with other believers. God's Word. And we've come across those who've met some Christians from other countries, especially those who have been persecuted, who find their way here looking for a church. They're looking for a church. And when asked why, they would share because they just want to sing. They've never experienced singing in their country out of fear of persecution or death, just to sing. And so keep in mind, you know, when Peter wrote this, this letter, it was for the purpose of safeguarding the church from the incessant onslaught of false teachers. They were very prevalent then, and it's still prevalent today. We have a lot of these characters today. You take a comfortable Christian who most likely have been encouraged to be comfortable by these false preachers, and what you have is spiritual complacency, a lack of zeal for God. You see, temptation, we are surrounded by temptation. We live in a world that is full of temptation. We somehow define our lives based on what the world wants us to believe our lives should be. A life of pleasure, a life of fun, a life of having this and that. And when we compare ourselves as Christians to these people, we somehow feel that we're being left behind or we're missing out on something. That's the temptation. Temptation that could lead us to be comfortable, too comfortable, and even content. And when I say content, it is not the content that uh, we are... Uh, taught as being content with what we have, per se, as to what the Lord blesses us with. But it's a, it's a good, bad thing. 
it's good to be content, but it's bad when you're too content to the sense that you become disinterested of being inconvenienced. You, um, you are uninterested in anything that would threaten that comfort that you have, that you have constructed for yourselves for the sake of your faith. That you are unwilling to go out of your way or be inconvenienced to share the gospel or to help a Christian in need or to pursue godliness and holiness because of being too comfortable. You are just content. Now false teachers come up with books. They all come up with stuff to fill our heads with ideas. Ideas such that you can live the most comfortable life now. Your best life now. But you know that is not true. But if you do believe you could live, you could live your best life now, then you must understand that you're going to hell, that you are going to hell. Because if there is a heaven, that is your best life. That is your best life to look forward to. The best is yet to come. But somehow they make way to entertain ideas that you can get a piece of heaven for yourself here, that you deserve what you want. You were born again, born into some sort of little God that can command whatever it is that you want your life to be. And the problem there is that it's all about you. It becomes about you and nothing about God. You see, you could see your life as a pillow. Your life is a pillow. You make the most comfy and fluffy pillow that you could make. You love your pillow. I think we all love our pillows, right? When we go to sleep, we know what that means or how it feels. But what about your cross? Do you love your cross? Do you love your pillow? Do you love your cross? Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his pillow, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, a sure sign of your faith as a Christian is too comfortable is if nothing in your life sets you apart as a follower of Jesus Christ to the point that even people that know you or are close to you outside of church can't tell you're a Christian. And so comfort, when we become too comfortable with this world, it diminishes our yearning for Jesus' return. And the church is not exempted from this. Complacency can be found in the local church. Many of us are content on pursuing material things. It's natural to us to pursue material things, to strive for success, for recognition. We want recognition. Even senior adults tend to be too busy enjoying their retirement to even long for Christ's return. I've still got this bucket list and I've got some items that I need to check off and so forth, and you, you spend a great deal of effort and energy pursuing that. Christ cannot come yet because I still got all these items. I still need, need to go here and there and do this and that. You know, um, for many Christians today, heaven has become too distant. Eternity too abstract. And even Jesus return us theoretical, theoretical in the sense that, oh, you know, probably he's not coming back tomorrow or next year or 10 years from now. It's very likely in the next 100 years or two generations from now, theoretically, there's no urgency, there's no yearning. Why? Because we're so consumed by, by our lives of what we want to happen in this life for us. For us, we need to live life on a first century footing, yearning for something that is just tremendously beautiful, something our eyes have never seen, and eternally satisfying. To see Jesus, as we sang earlier, and to be made like him. To live with an expectation, the kind of expectation that eclipses 
that transcends all other longings and expectations we find ourselves having in this world. Now let us turn to verse 12 and 13 of 2 Peter chapter 3 for a moment. I want to share something with you. And it says, Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Waiting for, hastening the coming, we are waiting for. Now these, these phrases, these terms are terms of expectancy. These are concepts of expecting something. They carry the idea of expectancy. There is a deep yearning for something, an eager expectation of something far better, a watchfulness, an eager desire. Not only are we watching and waiting, but we are also eagerly desiring something bigger, something better. And something to understand at this point, which you may have picked up, perhaps some of you may have picked up, the mention of two particular days, the day of the Lord and the day of God. Now, verse 10 reads, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And then in verse 12, it says, Waiting for and the hastening the coming of the day of God. Now, you see, these are two different days. They're not the same. They're two different days. The day of the Lord, as we opened earlier, is a day of judgment. That is the day of the Lord. It's what sets up the destruction of everything. It's what sets up the end of history and ushers in a new heavens and new earth. A place for us to dwell in light of God's eternal glory that follows. In that eternal state, that eternal glory is what we refer to as the day of God. So everything, everything ultimately resolves in God. God begins, God ends. Everything resolves in God. So the day of the Lord, as we long for it, the real longing is for what succeeds it. The day of the Lord is what we are to anticipate. It is what we want to be delivered from as belonging to Christ. And we are not to live in fear of this future, in fear of this judgment. As we said earlier, the Lord comes, the day of the Lord, the Lord comes to judge. It is of judgment. Instead, we are to live in holy eagerness, in a yearning, in expecting, having an expectant hope to be desirous of Jesus' coming. And the word coming is actually a beautiful word. It actually means presence. So verse 12 could actually read, waiting for and hastening the presence of the day of God. And presence here does not mean a place or an event. It refers to a person. And so we are waiting for the presence of Jesus Christ. And since we are to be delivered from the day of the Lord, that day of judgment, by the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ to enter into the eternal day of God, that day of glory, we should be living in that expectant hope, in expectation of that. Now we must remember to make way for the day of God, there must be a day of the Lord. If there is to be a new day for us, and a new kingdom, a new heaven, a new earth, a new universe in which righteousness dwells forever, then you see the Lord is going to have to destroy the old one. Everything is destroyed. That is the day of the Lord. And note that all this destruction that will take place is not by way of man's doing. It's not like some scientist somewhere pushed the wrong button and cause some nuclear holocaust to happen, nor is it by some natural process. Everything is by God's doing. Again, God begins and ends. 
He is sovereign. It is his work through the power of Christ to whom he has committed this judgment. And so we ought to be living in expectation of these realities. And our lives have to be characterized by that expectant hope. The hope that reigning with Christ in glory. It is our hope that the Lord finds us at peace as well. Being fully assured of our salvation. Having a strong sense of that assurance. That we will not be ashamed at his coming. His presence. And so we believe the return of Christ is imminent. And therefore we are called to live a sanctified life. That's the second implication. Living a sanctified life. If we are to live in light of Christ's return, holding on to the hope that we have, we are to live as sons of light, sons of the day, not sons of night and darkness. Remember, God is our Father in whom there is no darkness. If our longing is not right, if we do not long for the right things, then our living will not be right either. Take a look at verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. Simply put, we as Christians should have a spotless character and a blameless reputation. Spotless character, blameless reputation. Now, contrast this to the false teachers who were described in chapter 2 of that same letter. They were described as having stains and blemishes. We as Christians are called to be spotless and blameless in contrast to these false preachers who have stains and blemishes. Now, these terms refer both, they refer to your character and your reputation. Character speaks of what we are in reality. Reputation speaks of what people think we are. And so we have to be both spotless in our character, having no spots, no stains, and we are to be without blemish, that is to have a blameless, blameless reputation. We are to be pure as to who we are and pure in our reputation. Jonathan Edwards explains it this way, where he says he resolved never to do anything which he should be afraid to do if he expected it would not be above an hour before he should hear the last trumpet. And what it means is really having a healthy anticipation of Jesus' return such that it infuses our Christian life with an urgency and a focus in the spiritual disciplines needed to live a holy life. We are not to neglect these spiritual disciplines. In the New Testament, there is a clear connection. There's a clear connection between expecting Christ's return and living a sanctified life. Now, when you expect to meet Christ, your intention to be pure is made much more clear. To explain that, to illustrate that, if you knew, if you knew that you will be meeting Christ, if you knew you will, meeting, you will be meeting Jesus, over the next 12 weeks, would you start living a holy life? Yes. Will you be discerning of your sin? Will you be detesting sin? Confessing sin? Will you be desiring a holy life? Will you be abstaining from tempting situations that cause you to be sinful? Would you be faithful? knowing that you will see Christ in 12 weeks? Will you study the Bible thoroughly? Will you be praying fervently? Will you be worshiping God? All this so that you can maintain a pure life over the next 12 weeks. And that is what Jonathan Edwards was actually resolving. 
having a healthy anticipation, therefore infusing our Christian life with a more commitment, a better, stronger commitment to the spiritual disciplines needed to live a holy life. And so this is how the Lord wants us to live until he comes. And this is consistent with what you are anticipating in that eternal glorious day of glory, the day of God. See, if we understand it, we are destined to be glorious. We are destined to be pure. We are destined to live a life of eternal purity and holiness. Then we should ought to seek to live that way now. We shouldn't be waiting or playing around for that day to come. And so the more we contemplate the second coming, the more when we think about this, the more we will also be renewed in our evangelistic witness. That is the third implication. You see, this is rooted in the gospel and the Great Commission itself. We are to be characterized by evangelization. Peter says, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. You see, as we wait for this glorious day of God, we are to be using the time, the energy, the blessings we have, the gifts, our very lives that we have for the purpose of having a better life. No, purpose of our salvation, of salvation. We're not earning salvation. It is not to be earned, but then it speaks of salvation, salvation of others as well. The Lord is waiting in order that he might save. In other words, sometimes you think it's so long. Oh, is Christ really coming back? Man, that's such a long time. It was almost two years, 2,000 years. See, if you look at verse 9, we jump back to verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And count the patience of the Lord as salvation. Again, we are to be using our time, energy, blessing, gifts, our lives. Think about it. Had the Lord come in September 2005, I wouldn't know where I'd be. I'd probably be out, out of the kingdom wailing had he come 30 or 40 years before today none of us probably would be in that kingdom we would know had he come sooner than later this wouldn't exist something better far better would be and so that is why the lord is patient the lord is patient he is waiting patiently to the day, again, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, right? And a thousand years is like a day. He doesn't keep time like we do, right? Peter is saying here, the fact that we're waiting for the coming of Christ doesn't mean we are to do absolutely nothing, that we are just to sit around and wait we are to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. Paul writes and tells the Corinthians, therefore, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. We persuade others. When we think about the day of God, that eternal glory, that eternal state, that glorious day, a dwelling place of righteousness that is righteousness forever and ever, which is a blessing for us, for you and me, we also have to think of the day of the Lord, which is a cursing for those who do not believe. It is a cursing. It is a day of judgment, of destruction, a day you do not want to see yourselves in. For a Christian, it is a great day. The day of the Lord is a great day, ushers in the, the day of God for us. But it is a terrible day. A terrible, awful, awful day for an unbeliever. It is a day filled with terror. See, the Apostle John writes a very graphic illustration of this as he was contemplating judgment. And I'm going to take you through some 
parts of Revelation. We're going to go through a bit of Revelation here. So in Revelation 10, the angel of the God, the angel of God brought him a little scroll and gave it to him to eat it. So John takes the scroll. He's commanded, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. So John takes it, he eats it. It was sweet in his mouth, but it was bitter in his stomach. Now, this is symbolism. In this symbolism, the little scroll that John ate represents the truth of God's judgment. It is the truth of God's final judgment, which is bittersweet. On one hand, it is sweet. It is sweet because it ushers us, Christians, into the day of God. On the other hand, it is bitter because it means the eternal damnation of the unbelieving and unrepentant world. It is bitter for them. Now let's have a brief look at Revelation again to describe what the day of the Lord would look like. Again, keep in mind, the Lord returns to judge. In Revelation chapter 8, trumpets are blown to pronounce judgment at the end of the tribulation. Hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown into the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up. A third. Imagine a third. You probably take the entire North America and Central America to compose a third. That burns up. Then another trumpet sounds, and a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And again, a third of the sea became blood, and everything in it died. A third of sea life died. Now, this is just a preview. Imagine, it's just a preview. There are 22 chapters in Revelation. This is just chapter 8. Imagine, this is a preview of all of the all-consuming fire that will devastate everything at the end of the thousand years when the Lord sets up a new heaven and a new earth. See, in Revelations, as we go further, there are more judgments. Judgments are, are marked by trumpets, by, by bowls and seals. There are seal judgment, trumpet judgments, which are more rapid in its execution. You have the bowl judgments, which happen very, very quickly. In Revelation 16, verse 8, it says, The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch the people with fire. It was allowed to burn people. They were scorched by the fierce heat. Again, keep in mind, this is the day of the Lord. Chapter 20, verse 9. At the end of the thousand years, Satan is released from prison. He comes out to deceive people who have lived through that thousand years and still rejected Christ. Can you imagine? After all that, there are still people who reject Christ. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And in the verse that follows, And the devil who, was, who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Bottom line is, history has an end. Satan is defeated, and he will be cast in a lake of fire and sulfur forever and ever. And so with all those who have rejected Christ. That is how it's going to end. God has given us his word in the Old Testament and New Testament. Very descriptive previews of this end. Now John writes that the world is passing away. The world, its system, the social, economic, political, religious systems, the earth, the universe, everything will be consumed. Those who dedicate their lives to so-called preserving Mother Earth, save the dolphins, save the planet, are all doing so in vain. When you think about it, you put it in that light. 
that someday God will destroy everything. See, church, when God's day arrives, the final destruction has taken place. Nothing that we know that exists will no longer be. Man's day is over. It is done with. And I guess that's why they call it the day of God. It's God's day. Now, I shall return. These were words spoken by a man, which proved to be true over time in our history. But there is another man, not just by any, not just any man, but a God man, who says, Behold, I am coming soon. Jesus, our Savior, fully God, fully man, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, whose blood was shed for many as a propitiation for our sins, redeeming us that we may not suffer the price of death, but to be restored in our fellowship with the Father, reconciled, looking forward to the day when we will be reigning with Christ for all eternity, to be with God in all His glory forever, not just for a thousand years, forever, a promise that will certainly be fulfilled in time. And as we conclude, See, we are called to live a godly and holy life in anticipation of the promised return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to anticipate this. The Lord Jesus comes to rapture his church. And then comes the day of the Lord, followed by the Holocaust of judgment. We are to live a spotless and blameless life of purity. We are to desire that life that we may also be in perfect peace of being assured that the day of the Lord will pass us by. See, when we come back with him to reign, we will reign for a thousand years in our glorified bodies. And at the end of that time, he destroys the universe, he destroys everything and ushers us, the redeemed, all of us, the redeemed, finally into the glorious day of God. That's what we are made for. And that is what we should be expecting. As they say, the best is yet to come. That is the best to expect. You can't find that here in this life. You can't be fooled into thinking that you can have your best life here. Heaven, eternity with God is your best life. Amen. And because the day of the Lord is a day of judgment for the unredeemed, all the more we are to renew our witnessing, to live a life of evangelization. If you are someone who is still on the fence with respect to your faith in Christ, or simply put, you are still doubtful, somehow finding yourself still so attached to the world, having trouble letting go of what this world has to offer, think about it well. You see, there will be a day of reckoning. Church, there will be a day of destruction, damnation, forever suffering for those who have rejected Christ. You know, just as Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection were prophesied and have since then been fulfilled, brothers and sisters, so too will his second coming. It will be fulfilled. It's just a matter of time. And so we are to pray for God's grace, especially for those who are still unrepentant or in disbelief who cannot see or cannot accept the fact that there is a God who saves through his son. Now for believers like you and me, you may ask, why is this important? How is this of relevance to us? Since we are not going to face this kind of condemnation, we are saved. We have, we have, um, we have been saved. We are, we are righteous in God's eyes. We are to be taken up by the Lord and so forth and so on. How is this so important to us? Well, we have loved ones, don't we? We have friends. We have family. Even others whom God has placed in our path who still are in disbelief. We have loved ones who are headed for condemnation if they have rejected Christ. And there are many others whose ears have not heard the gospel. See, the Lord is not slow 
to fulfill his promise as, a, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Church, while we have time, let us spend it wisely, not just to enrich ourselves with wealth and, and blissful memories. Those are good things, but let's also put ourselves to work, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. The Lord says, Behold, I am coming soon. Remember, the return of Christ is presented in Scripture as a call to action, not as a reason to just stay put and do nothing. Let us pray. Father, thank you for reminding us of what lies ahead of us. Thank you for the faith that has turned our hearts to Jesus and be saved. Thank you for redeeming us to be with you. Thank you that we shall never be condemned, but to live in your eternal glory. We were never worthy to begin with, but because of your tremendous love for us, you gave us your life. You gave your life for us. We didn't deserve this, but you offered us salvation freely. Father, I know that this may not be the case yet for some here, for some people that we know, that we love. We pray this morning for those who are here, those whom we know who are headed for the terrible day of judgment. We pray that you'll turn their hearts and come to Jesus, not only for the blessing of joy and peace in this life, but also for eternal glory. Lord, we save more this morning that they may join us in your kingdom, inheriting a new heaven and a new earth and the glorious day of yours. And for those of us here who belong to you, Lord, may we all live in expectant hope, looking to dwell in your eternal righteousness, desiring to be made like Jesus and renewed in our witnessing for Christ alone. In this we pray in his holy name. Amen. Thank you for joining us in today's online Sunday service. We'd love to have you with us in our next in-person service. We'd love to get to know you and meet you and also pray with you. If you'd like to connect with us, you can call or text us at 0917-574-3713 or write us at info at wordcommunity.org. If you wish to check us out on social media, we are at WordCom Church on Instagram or Facebook or Word Community Church on YouTube. For your convenience, you may give your tithes and offerings through our online giving platforms being flashed on your screens right now. Thank you for tuning in, and we wish you a blessed week ahead. God bless.